How do you see this changing how students learn? Personally, I'm very optimistic on that. This would definitely cause a paradigm shift in how we learn and how we teach students, but it's going to a positive direction that really boosts our efficiency. I don't see why there's a trend of skepticism of people shouldn't be using AI, AI is everywhere. I'm tired of it because if you can take the airplane to UK, why are you selling the boat to UK? I feel like there's no excuse to doing things in a less efficient way. Welcome, Digital Pathology Trailblazers. Today, my guest is Dr. Candice Chu, author of the recent paper of Chat GPT in Veterinary Medicine. So I saw this paper on LinkedIn, and I'm going to give you a little bit more detail how we know each other from social media, spoiler alert. But I saw this paper, and I'm like, oh, I need to invite her because she needs to tell me and you how she did it. Candice is a veterinary clinical pathologist and clinician scientist at Texas A&M University and an online educator. So online education is where I met her for the first time on Instagram. Uh, so I'm going to link to her Instagram platform. It's a uh, vet clean path professor. It used to be vet clean path resident, but uh, since I met her, she became a professor. So uh, that's where a lot of her audience is. Welcome, Candice, to the show, to the Digital Pathology Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for joining. Um, so let's start with you. We always start with the mm -hmm. guest. So let the Digital Pathology tra Trailblazers um, know about you, your background, and also your journey, because your journey to where you are right now is, uh, I guess, geographically and in general, not that standard. Yeah, sure. Um, so I uh, obtained my DVM degree in Taiwan at National Taiwan University. And I came to United States um, about exactly 10 years ago, starting from Texas A&M University that I uh, pursued my PhD degree in veterinary pathobiology. And then after I finished the PhD, I stayed on for three more years to complete the veterinary clinical pathology residency. I got boarded. And then I moved to Pennsylvania um, as an assistant professor of clinical pathology, worked there about two years, and recently decided to move back to Texas A&M because I love Texas so much. Is it like um, weather-wise, is it similar to Taiwan? Where you come from? Yeah, weather-wise is pretty similar. Uh, Taiwan, I would say it's pretty much as hot as in Texas, but Taiwan is more humid. So sometimes in the dry season, ah, okay. Texas, it feels better. Okay, so it's not even that bad. Yeah. So we actually met in person at the ACVP conference, American College of Veterinary Pathology conference last year. And I was giving a presentation about AI in veterinary pathology. I'm an uh, anatomic pathologist. So my uh, AI presentation was more like anatomic pathology and image analysis heavy. But I was uh, comparing and contrasting the reach of a digital pathology static images in literature with what's happening in social media. And Candice, your profile that I featured uh, was one of the uh, most like visited, the, the highest amount of followers on your profile. And it was so cool because then I saw you uh, in, the, in front of the microphone and he says, I'm the owner of this account. And I'm like, it's so <laughs> great to see you in person. And then we took a selfie. So that's a little side story. Um, but uh, so being in this online teaching space, I think we are more um, exposed or like tend to use the different AI tools more than people who are not so active in the online space. Um, so naturally, we start thinking, how can we leverage it for our science? And this is the topic of today's episode because you wrote a paper uh, and the protagonist of this paper is your customized GPT for clinical pathology. So um, let's talk about this paper. Let's talk about what inspired you to write it and then we're going to dive into how you built this GPT. Sure. Um, 
So the first idea came from my、uh, career transition period that I left UPenn and in the process of moving to Texas, and I figure, well, I have some time, and I always consider myself as a tech savvy person, like I'm the so-called IT in my lab, like anything related to computer, I will jump in and solve the problems.、Um, so since I have some time. And then AI is such a trending topic, so I spent some time reading like papers about AI, and realized there are actually many publications,、uh, for example, like review papers, in human medicine side talking about how AI,、uh, especially generated AI like ChatGPT, can be applied to.、Uh, I love this part of your paper where you say like how many hours are being wasted in. Filling the electronic health records, which then they like print on paper anyway. Yeah. But I love this this initial part. I'm gonna Google right now how many hours it was. Unless you remember, do you remember? I remember it's like 35 percent of their time is spent. Yes. Like, can you imagine 35、yeah. percent of doctors' time is they are either typing before, like during the visit, or after? Like, so they only work. Actually, sixty-five percent of the time. Yes. Yes. Pardon my math if I didn't calculate it correctly, but I think I did. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I love that. So,、uh, also a comment to、uh, tech savvy and IT person. This is, you know, if you want to do digital pathology nowadays, this is what you need to have, or you need to have a person like that in your lab because there is going to be troubleshooting. Like as much as I love the technology. There is still a lot of troubleshoot. Yes, but、uh, of course I interrupted you. Going back to my question, <laughs> the paper. So、uh, one more question in between. How much time did you have between the jobs? Um, roughly remember. I think like several months. I have because it hasn't、mm-hmm. been a good chunk of time since I started my PhD. You know, like one thing after another. Even after I took the board exam. Or oh, even after I finished the PhD program, I think I only had about like one week of vacation before starting my residency. And then right after the residency, it was like board exam, finding jobs, moving across different states. So there was no time for me to really spend time on things that I want to learn more、um, in in the past ten years. So that was a good time for me to be like, okay. Now I have some me time. I can rethink about what be my future goal of my career and what I want to spend time on to learn as a new stuff. And that so in your free time you decide to write the paper. Yes, and I enjoy the process very much. <laughs> That's great. So did you like write the paper first, or did you create the GPT first? That is a good question. I think how, how I, was the like c- combination of these two? Yeah, I think I might be doing both at the same time. And actually, it all started from that、um, I agree to ACVIM,、uh, American College of Veterinary、mm-hmm. Internal Medicine, to do a talk on AI in their meeting.、Um, you just recently gave this talk, yes, right? Yes. So I agreed to that. I'm、so、going to do this on talk. So sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in the process of like preparing for this talk, then I realized, yeah, what I'm doing right now is actually the same thing as writing a review paper. Why don't I just just write a review paper, right? Since it's like the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so I started to work on the review paper, and somehow got the idea of like, oh, it would be cool. To build a custom GPT because I read that、um, somewhere in my literature search, so I'm kind of like doing both at the same time. Okay, so、um, that GPT, let's talk about it. So you basically,、uh, this is a custom GPT built on the OpenAI framework. So this is something that's out there that people can already use, right? And it's、yes. ClinPath specific. Yes, veterinary clean path specific. Yes. So, walk me through the process. How you did it? What tools did you need for it? Like everything. Like oh, 
first you need to have the paid account for GPT, then you yes. need to whatever, like, tell me the process. Yeah, so um, um, in order to use the GPT, you don't have to pay OpenAI, but you do need to have an account with mm -hmm. them. Um, but if you want mm -hmm. to create your custom GPT, you need to pay them. So that's about $20 per month. And once you have that, you can create this GPT for your own use to set it to be a private account, or you can publish it as what I did for the Vetclean Pet GPT. And the advantage of using a custom GPT instead of just using the chat GPT is that you can provide a specific material to the chatbot so that they will only look for answer in the material you provided. And you can even restrict, like I only want you to look at information on these specific websites so that you can ensure the information that you're getting, um, your users are getting are accurate and um, it's scientifically sound instead of just a random blog article on internet and talking about clinical pathology. I think it touches on the main fear that people have using this for medical purposes. And I think many uh, of the, I, I call me included, the people who are um, using this are like commercial tool users are afraid of the hallucinations. This is like the buzzword that, oh, even well, if it's going to start hallucinating about the things that I don't know about and I will not be able to verify. And I think um, it's not advertised enough or like not communicated enough that, hey, you can prevent it by uh, what you did. You can prevent it by telling it to just use the specific resources that I provided that yes. you can tell it to reference um, things where like exactly on which page or in which paragraph um, it found the information. So which uh, material did you train it on? In, so because it's like, okay, there's this general uh, large large language model, the, the GPT, the chat GPT, now we have the 4.0 or I don't know if we have some turbo or something like that the next level so basically you leverage the power of this plus you give additional data that this model is referencing right yes so i use um open source uh, available textbooks that i found online that they are allow they will allow um because if you look into the uh, the common creation license that they have different mm -hmm. levels and you need to make sure they do have this, they don't have this like non um, derivative level uh, restriction because mm -hmm. um, it's kind of in the gray zone. Like some people consider um, if you feed this information in AI and I spill out the answer for you, that's kind of like a derivative of the original work. And in that case, that will mm -hmm. violate um, the common creation license. So I chose the material that uh, specified that they allow this type of usage and also finding resources from the eCleanPath website because they also have this open uh, CC creation, uh, uh, not CC creation, uh, cre Creative Commons uh, license as well. Creative Commons. Yeah. Which, by the way, I know that your posts on your Instagram are under one of the levels of the Creative Commons license. So, yes, yes. Uh, Thank you so much for making it available for people. So if you guys want to cite uh, posts from Instagram from Dr. Candice Chu, uh, it's possible. I think it's the attribution or which one do you have? I, I don't remember what I have. I have to check it on Instagram. We're right going to Google but... it right now. Yeah. But basically, it says exactly what you can do and what you cannot. Definitely you need to cite where you took it from. So yes. uh, yeah which is what I did in my presentation because I cited your Instagram. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, really, really cool. Did you have a lot of material to train the chat on? Um, because you were restricted by the license and, and by the availability of the material. How did you curate it? Where did you take it from? Uh, and what was it? Was it just articles? Was it books? Uh, other than the website that you mentioned as well? What did yeah, you put so, in there and how much data was there? So there are um, several textbooks. Um, there are more basics ones like uh, histology textbooks, but there are also a book that's specified in um, 
clinical laboratory works. So that's very relevant to backlink path. And of course, there are eClean path websites as well. And、uh, how I train this model is I tell this model that please provide、um, those sources with their answer. But you know, sometimes ChatGPT they won't like always listen to your instructions. So, but every time if you ask a question, you got an answer. You can always ask the GPT like, can you provide the source? And then usually it will provide you like if it's from eClean Path, it could provide you a URL. If it's from the book, it provide you the name of the book. And you even you can even ask like、uh, which page、um, is this information from, and then it will tell you the answer. So yeah, you you can always go back to your original source when you're looking for answers. And the other thing、um, I try to emphasize in that tool is、um, this is a tool to facilitate the learning for veterinary students. Um, specifically for、yes. veterinary clinical pathology, it is not a tool for your medical consult <laughs> to answer questions for your patients or provide any like、um, medical advice.、Mm-hmm. So, how can students use it? Like, what is what would be the best use case to leverage this tool when you're learning clinical pathology? Would it be more for Veterinary students, or already for residents, or for both. How do you envision this as an educational tool for them? Yeah, I think it's for both.、Um, it's the most obvious use user、uh, scenario would be、um, if you attend the lecture of veterinary clinical medicine and then、uh, medical clinical pathology, and then you have questions, but maybe.、Um, You're too shy. You don't want to ask the instructor, or、um, you kind of come up this question when you got home. You can always ask the question in ChatGPT because what it offers is、um, offered by those chatbot function is is not like when you Google for answer, you can only put in you know, keywords, one keyword space, the second keywords, and maybe you add some logical relation like and or or. But you always have to like parse through all the answers and find the right one for you. However, in using this chatbot function, is like you are talking to a actual professor on your computer about your question, and you know that those answers were only from the textbook. So you can be one hundred percent sure that this is the answer you want. So that's the most obvious user scenario. But there are also much more than that.、Um, you can ask. This chatbot to create some questions for you. Like, can you create some true or false question? Can you create some multiple choice question、um, to help me to learn? For example,、um, acid base interpretation in this case. And then more advanced than that would be if you have a case. That say you have a blog work, and that could be like a JPEG or a PDF file. You can upload those files to the chatbot and ask, like, what's your interpretation? So I, I mean, for this function, a lot of、uh, veterinary educators would be terrified because that means that is the end of all this like take-home homework,、um, open-ended questions, and even for、uh, trainers, for graduate students,、um, there will be no more of those like preliminary exam that you take home. And go through five open-ended question and think about it for two days. Now they can get the answer in five minutes. Yes.、Yeah, so how do you see this changing the education? By the way,、uh, a, a curiosity in Poland. I'm from Poland,、mm-hmm. and recently I learned that the government mandated that there will be no homework for kids. Oh, really? I don't know. Yes. And I'm like, hmm. On one hand, I'm like. Okay, will they then learn at school what they're supposed to learn? And on the other hand, I'm like, yeah, they already eight hours at school, and then they have to do like four hours of homework. So I'm kind of in between. I don't know if it's good or bad. I guess in ten years we're gonna see、um, what happened to the kids. But that's like an official country mandate that there is supposed to be no homework. So wow.、Uh, I don't know where it's gonna lead us, but definitely, yeah, it's not something like no. Also with internet, that was already okay. You you have questions, you can find the、um, answer in the internet. But then you actually had to like 
rewrite it. Now we, we will have to do that. You yes. can <laughs> upload a transcript of this is my last paper. Based on my last paper, please provide another paper that answers these questions. So yeah. how are you going to, because you're going to be teaching students, you're going to, are you going to be using it in your, uh, as a teaching tool? How are you planning to design your curriculum with this integrated on, or in general, you know, if, even if your ClinPath and GPT was not available, these tools are available and people can customize or not even customize. Like, how do you see this changing how students learn? Yeah, I got a question from my talk at ACBIM as well, that there are, because um, I talk about how to use digital and AI tools to streamline your uh, academic writing process from um, identifying the paper, um, preparing for literature review, and then actually writing it down. Um, there are questions okay. from the audience that they worry about, like, oh, if all these like AI tools, they can um, summarize the paper and generate the notes for you, would that take away the critical thinking of our trainees? And personally, I'm very optimistic on that because I feel like what AI is doing is just saving your time to do those like redundant, repetitive works. But that means it frees you from those works and now you have more time to actually look at the, for example, the summarize or the outline and to think about um, what's the main question that is being asked in this paper. Mm -hmm. And then you have more time to do your critical thinking. And one thing also proposed from the audience is that um, they now have changed their questions a little bit. So they don't ask those obvious questions that you can use AI to find the answer, but they may present something and then ask you like, why do you think the author will put it this way? So more like um, maybe presented and summarized um, summary made by the AI and then ask follow-up questions from, uh, from the students. So I think mm -hmm. um, this would definitely cause a paradigm shift in how we learn and how we teach students, but it's going to a um, positive direction that really boosts our efficiency. I think so too. I'm looking for a new uh, AI literature search tool that I recently learned about. Mm -hmm. I will find it before the end of the episode. But uh, so see, I'm thinking totally opposite. It's going to, the critical thinking and reviewing of these things is going to be required. It's going to be the thing that like is going to be now trained because all the memorization and retrieval of information is taken care of. And then you go through it. And at the end, I think it's going to be also um, with the use of these tools. Um, and we're going to get to the ethical use, which is another point that you mentioned in your paper. But I think th there is going to be for ethical use. I see something that's going to be super necessary is the emphasis of being responsible for the ultimate output of this. Yes. Regardless what tools you used, if you sign your name, be it on a paper, on a presentation, lecture you're giving, or a report, in my case, it is your name. And you are responsible if you like didn't review uh, what the tool put out, it's on you. It doesn't matter what you used. Um, and I see it very much um, in the peer review process or even like scientific review process of my reports. Um, I write them. I think I did the best job possible. And then the second pair of eyes, my reviewer looks at it and finds like obvious things, uh, which are range from like everything, right? Um, some redundant sentences, uh, spelling mistakes, which, oh my goodness, if I didn't have a spell checker, as a non-native English speaker, uh, probably, I probably make still mistakes on social media. I hope yeah, me too. <laughs> it's just non-native speaker, please forgive. Um, but you know, there are now, now are the tools and it, it's a reason. And uh, like, let's say, let's take this spelling. The reason I make spelling mistakes is that English is not my native language, uh, but it's also an excuse because uh, there are tools that can help me overcome this uh, 
characteristic of myself, let's call it that way, right? And it's going to be the same uh, for other things, right? Yeah. If there is a shortcoming, whatever it might be, you know, a lack of material experience, uh, spelling, there is going to be a tool that you can leverage to overcome this short. So there's not going to be any more excuses. I think it's going to be, I, I, I see it as leverage. I see it as a tool um, that can leverage our, the stuff that we are great at, um, like analyzing critical thinking, um, maybe then like discussing uh, analyzing on the fly with the context that we have, like you mentioned, the um, a description of a case and on the fly asking people to analyze, right? You can get maybe five minutes and Google slash chat GPT, whatever you want, but then you have to defend your answer. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's like um, as a clinical veterinarian, you might have a challenging case or you're trying to recall something from your memory. And typically you mm -hmm. do is you go back to, you leave the exam room and go back to your office and then you start to like flee through the textbook or whatever. Now it's the same of using that custom GPT. Like you have those test books ready, but now you have a smarter way to search to find the information that you want. So I think by taking that approach, whether you use other people, um, the custom GPT built by other people, or you have the ability to build your own GPT based on the textbook that you you uh, commonly reference to, um, those are just more better, more efficient way for you to find the information you need in your shorter time. Um, so from that perspective, I don't see why um, there's a there's a there's a there's a trend of like skepticism of like oh people shouldn't be using AI AI is everywhere I'm tired of it because for me it's like yes, if you can take the airplane to UK why why are you selling the boat to UK and yes that's like, I mean yeah that's other the than obvious and, or you yeah, know yeah I feel like there's no excuse to um doing things in a less efficient way in this mm -hmm. AI era. Very much. Same like with a car. Okay, you're going to walk there and you're going to be late or you're going to take a bike and you're going to be late if you can take a car. Yeah. Uh, or like you mentioned, the plane or anything. And by the way, I found a website. Let me share it here. Oh, great. It's called, I actually learned about, I don't know if you read more about it. It's called um, undermind.ai. Mm -hmm. And um, you need an account, you can have a free one, and it searches. So let's see if we can search for Candace paper. Uh, what is the use of AI in veterinary medicine? Can you restrict your answers to the literature? from the last three years let's see if it shows up your paper has okay i don't know if it shows yeah it yeah but i want right? it's just showing the application of ai in veterinary medicine has significantly oh, grown it's asking you whether you're looking for a specific type of publication oh yes 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 it could review yes. articles okay yes please include all reviews so see it's even talking to me it's asking me um, if I want to have specific uh, specific references. All reviews from the past three years. Oh, wow. It even tells me what I'm supposed to ask. So I have, a, I have a, an account already, but I have not played with it yet. Let's see. I want to see if it finds Candy's paper. But while this is searching, um, let's talk about ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on ethics and AI use? Because I think that's another fear. First one is hallucinations. We kind of addressed that. The other one, is it ethical? It's going to take away jobs. Uh, and in general, uh, another aspect of ethics would, okay, what data was used and you were very strict in your selection criteria, used um, things under a certain type of creative common license. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what are your thoughts 
ethics and generative language AI. Yeah, one um, very popular use of AI tools in veterinary clinic is the note-taking tools. Like it can record mm -hmm. your conversation with the client. I love it. And then it will uh, output in a specific format. A lot of people like to use the, uh, the SOAP note uh, to take the progress note of the patient. Um, one obvious ethical problem is have you obtained the consent from the client? For the recording, are they aware mm -hmm. that you are using this tool um, to record their conversations? And you always have to, you know, be the one to put the signature on it. Like, I, like you mentioned, like you would be the author of the work, so you take the one hundred, uh, you take the full uh, responsibility. So you always have to review those notes after it's been generated, and then put your name on it. I think that would be like one mm -hmm. ethical concern of using those AI tools. And the other thing we need to pay attention about is um, there are tools to provide diagnosis. For example, um, there are so many tools right now um, it will interpret the X-ray for you. And those are like veterinary uh, radiology AI tools that you can use. However, um, if you go to their website, you will notice that some of them are backed up by scientific publications. Some of them are not. So how would you mm -hmm. know the interpretation and diagnosis they provide is accurate enough? That would be another concern. Yes. So see, that is, um, yeah, that's something that uh, you need to do your due diligence on, um, on the tool, right? Mm -hmm. So like in case of your GPD, okay, there is a list of literature that this was based on. And by the way, we have our results. Yes. Let's see what we have in a second. But um, yeah, you have a list of literature. And with image analysis based tools, it's a little bit different because what are you going to check? Like on what images it yeah. was uh, created? It's a little bit, so it's a little bit less verifiable by a non-expert. Whereas words, anybody can verify words and anybody can see, okay, this was based on these and these publications. The impact factor of the journal was this and that. And these were the authors, right? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that uh, the information there is 100% accurate? If you have read any like publications on how is the scientific peer review, uh, <laughs> then that's another discussion for a whole, uh, yes. whole other you know, series of podcasts. But in general, this is like the best way we have to trust information, there is a peer review process. And, you know, at some point you stop doubting and decide, okay, this is what I go with. So, yeah, let's talk about uh, the AI uh, in academic writing. And I saw on social media that you got a chance to have like a um, spontaneous presentation. Uh, your main presentation was on, a, on the general AI topic, and then you jumped in into uh, the spontaneous presentation about leveraging AI tools for scientific um, scientific work, scientific um, literature creation or writing. How do you approach that? Like, what tools do you use? Like, if somebody is writing a review, for example, right now, um, what tools would you recommend and how would you approach the whole process? Yeah, so the process, um, I divide that talk into um, several different actions uh, sections. So it starts with um, how you find those literature that you're interested in. So instead of using keyword to search periodically, um, I would leverage the RSS function so you can subscribe to the newest updated paper. For example, for me, um, I have a section called AI in Veterinary Medicine. So based on mm -hmm. the keyword I provided, um, those uh, new articles will always show up on my RSS platform. So I can um, just open a single web page. So how do you do that? Where can you subscribe for RSS? Because I do it I do it like a subscription on PubMed. Is that the same? And I have AI yeah. and digital pathology. Yes, that would be the same. You can use the advanced search function and then uh, create RSS based on that. Or you can uh, just click on the RSS button of a specific journal that you're interested in. For example, like General of Veterinary okay. Medicine. They provide that as well. So that would be the first step. And then the second step is how you collect all the information and put into your citation management tool. 
Um, I used to use yes. um, EndNote, and that is a mm -hmm. proprietary um, paid software, usually when you are associated with a university, so you have access to Institution, you, know. you can yes. use that. Yes. I switched oh. to Zotero when, yeah, I, when I left the university. <laughs> yes. And what's really fascinating about Zotero is it's now integrated with so many other either digital or AI tools that are super useful in academic writing so that you don't have to, mm -hmm. um, you know, find the papers or drag the paper from your folder into those platforms. You just have to log into your Zotero account and everything in your library will be automatically imported into the tool that you want to use. So do you then use the AI uh, things from Zotero or do you use separate AI tools? Yeah, those would be um, separate, uh, uh, your separate, paper. separate tools. Oh, really? That's it's awesome. found your paper, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to go back to Zotero, but we have to look at what our uh, undermined found. So mm. we now are super specific and we have topic match. There is a score for topic match and, and you are 85%, which I don't know what the score is, but I'm going to figure it out by the time I make a review about it. But uh, there is Candice Chu, Chat GPT and Veterinary Medicine, a practical guidance of generative artificial intelligence in clinics, education, and research 2024, Frontiers in Veterinary Science, which is like super new. Um, wh when was it published? Because the moment you published it on LinkedIn, it was still under review, right? You had the author's yeah. copy to share. And now it's actually officially published. Let's let's click it. Let's show it. Yeah, it's actually published one day before my talk at SCVIM. So that was very exciting. <laughs> oh, and congratulations. 436 downloads already. And I was one of the people who downloaded it. Thank you. 1,557 total views. I need to accept the cookies. That's okay. So yeah, if oh, and I love this one. There is like a special table of key takeaways. Yes. Uh, if somebody is too lazy to read the paper, or if somebody already read it and forgot, like me, uh, you can just go and take the key, uh, take the key takeaways. Mm -hmm. There is a full table, and I also love your um, your graphic abstract. Your graphic abstract is so cute. It um. It is uh, the theme of the graphics that you have on Instagram, actually. I recognize these little, uh, the style mm -hmm. from your Instagram account. And on the graphic, for those who are not watching on YouTube, uh, we have like a division of, uh, the, do you remember those circles where the biggest circle is AI, then within AI there is machine learning, and then within is generative AI, and then within are large language models, and then there are arrows going to different uses of ChatGPT in medicine, in veterinary medicine, um, which obviously overlaps with uses in life. Uh, but yeah, so I, I'm going to be exploring. I actually have to write a paper that is overdue for a year already. I don't want to admit it, so I'm going to talking about what paper that is but i'll try to use this undermine tool and let's see if i can somehow integrate it with zotero or use it in parallel with zotero i'm gonna link to this um, in the show notes as well amazing so are you planning to like have a module in your what are you going to be teaching at texas a and um, so I'll be teaching the second year veterinary and clinical pathology course. And because I just recently started my own lab, I am actually protected from teaching for the first two long semesters. Um, however, I volunteered to do a uh, two-hour lecture on um, electrolytes and acid base, because that's one of the topics that I'm interested in in veterinary and clinical pathology. And other opportunities that came up after I presented this work at the ACVIM is I was invited to lecture to um, all the new coming graduate students at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Texas A&M University about how to use these AI and digital tools 
um, to streamline their literature review and also academic writing process. And I think this would be super helpful for incoming graduate students so that they learn the most efficient way at the beginning of their graduate study. Very much. I remember me trying to, so I started my PhD and residency after working three years in the clinic and I suffered trying to go through scientific literature. Like it took me a long time before I was able to just like extract the information I wanted and not be intimidated by the way the papers are written because they're written for a normal person speaking normal English, they're written in an intimidating way. <laughs> very, very you know, scientific and specific language. And, and my mission is also like to present the information from science in a clear way so that people can take action on it. Yes. And if the there is a barrier, well, I don't want to say it's a barrier because this is the way science is communicated in the science circles. But I think there is a missing piece of the chain to later take this form of communication and take it further to people who are not yet that advanced in their scientific career, be it by AI tools, be it, you know, by what I do or what you do on social media, um, to bring this information to people who communicate in a different way than the language of scientific papers. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for creating the ClinPath Chat GPT. Am I butchering the name? Vet Clean Path Ch GPT, yes. Vet Clean Path GPT. I'm gonna link to the Vet Clean Path GPT in the show notes. So anybody who wants to see, actually, you, you know who would be your target audience as well. The anatomic veterinary anatomic pathologist who had to study Clean Path for the boards and then oh. immediately after the boards, uh, totally forgot. <laughs> and uh, here, truly yours is uh, raising her hand. Because I remember when I was learning it for my boards, I was like, this is logical. This is like analytical. And then like two months after, I'm like, what? Acid-based? Yes. <laughs> How about I ask my clinical pathologist colleague, colleagues? So thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much for uh, doing what you do. Uh, your students or future students and colleagues are up for a treat. Uh, and keep trailblazing. Candice, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And I hope to see you at some conference again in person that we'll have to do a live um, live podcast. Where where are you going next? Um, so I will actually be attending ACVP meeting this year. Oh. Yeah. I and I will I... be talking about the topic of how to use digital AI tools to help your academic writing in the work so going yet but if anything changes then this is going to be the place where we... yes you have a wonderful <laughs> day thank you thank you so much for listening if you stay till the end you are a true digital pathology trailblazer and you do want to leverage ai for your work uh, however it's possible i would encourage you to check uh, obviously, the paper and everything is linked in the description, but also check the literature research tool, undermind.ai. Uh, check it out and um, let's see if it's helpful for you in your literature research and in your scientific paper writing. And I talk to you in the next episode.